Coming to you from the beautiful studios of Proven Winners, Color Choice Shrubs. As a matter of fact, we're in Studio A, Stacy. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Stacy, I'm thinking this week we talk about specimens, and I'm not talking about those people who go to the gym every day and, you know, work out. Uh, no, we're talking about plant specimens, plant specimens. Although, just like a treadmill, some plants will sweep you off your feet. That is for sure. And, you know, a specimen planting is the the plant or plants, because sometimes you have more than one specimen planting, yep. depending on your, your landscape, that uh, really does sweep you off your feet. It's the one that gets all the attention. And, uh, you know, I'm going to confess right off the bat here that I have trouble. I have not really picked a specimen planting yet because I can't decide. I know it's hard. It's hard. Well, maybe we start here. Let's define what a specimen is, what a specimen plant uh, is. It's kind of the the drive by your house and the wow and ring the doorbell and what is that plant? But it's it's like it's a living art piece. And, uh, you know, so what defines it? Is it because it's rare? Is it because it's large? Is it because it's old? I mean, what defines a specimen plant in your mind? Well, I think all of those factors can play into it. Uh, but I don't think any of them are inherently necessary on their own. I think that a specimen planting is very much about how it's sited, where it's planted and how it's sited. And, um, you know, anything really, even a very humble, you know, plant, like let's take uh, limelight hydrangea, for okay. example, right? Mm -hmm. Limelight hydrangea is a plant that is often planted. It's often planted in hedges and gardens and all of these other things, but it can absolutely be a magnificent specimen, Absolutely. depending on how you situate it in your landscape. Now, I think most people, I think probably the archetypical or most common specimen plant, at least out here in Michigan, I'm going to say weeping cherry. I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're, you know, usually uh, a weeping something yes, weeping is, is considered as, you know, weeping spruce, pine, whatever it is, yeah. weeping cherry. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, though. I define it uh, as a show-off in a conspicuous location. Yeah. Does that make sense? That, that makes perfect sense. And, yeah. you know, if someone is, is kind of struggling with, with understanding this concept, well, if you're in your car and you happen to be on a residential street, you know, if you, have a, if you can do so safely, look around. And it's pretty easy, even in winter, usually, to identify those specimens. And I think often specimen uh, plants have kind of gone in and out of fashion, right? So my in-laws live in a neighborhood that was built in the 1970s, and everyone, every house has a specimen crab apple. Oh, and wow. at this point, they are fantastic. Yeah. But, you know, I think more in the 80s, that's when those weeping uh, cherries started to become quite the thing. Although, of course, weeping cherries have been specimen plants in Japan for centuries. Um, there was a blue spruce specimen craze at some point. Um, but now I think people really take the opportunity to come to find something that really expresses their personality. And you know what I really like in a specimen planting? What's that? When someone matches or complements the color of their house or oh. their front door or something like that. Because I think a lot of people don't really consider color when it comes to specimen. But you know how there's this trend of painting your front door yes. a really bold color? Purple, I think that's a pink. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a great cue. Uh, it doesn't have to match, but you can contrast it. That's a really easy and fun way to pick a specimen that even well after you change the color of your door is going to look fantastic. I like that. And, you know, those extroverts out there in the landscape, they, they can even show off in, in winter. And, yes, it's still winter, <laughs> but spring is on the way. You know, it, a specimen, Stacy, does not have to be a tree. We think about sequoias or redwoods on the West Coast or a dawn redwood or something like that. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a tree. Uh, of course, we find a lot of these specimens on college campuses here in West Michigan, Aquinas College, Albion College. Uh, you go to the East Coast, you know, right there on busy Long Island, uh, Hofstra University. Beautiful with a bird sanctuary. And the interesting thing about specimens for me, Stacy, is that storms call attention 
to specimens. In other words, when we lose those mm. specimens, here in Spring Lake where we're broadcasting, um, it was 1998, we had a, a storm that came through and we saw a lot of these specimen trees drop. Or Hurricane Andrew in 1992. As a matter of fact, I was in Florida, the Homestead area, in 1993-94 after Hurricane Andrew, and many of those farms where they grew uh, large tropical plants were abandoned, mm. and the plants were laying on the, their side. So they started growing to the light and yep. grew at a 90-degree angle, and suddenly they became Hurricane Andrew specimens, <laughs> and everybody so. wanted them. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a tree. Well, and it, you're, you're right. It doesn't have to be a tree. It can be a shrub. But typically, specimens are woody plants mm -hmm. because if they're herbaceous perennials, well, they're not really pulling their weight in winter. But I think your um, example of storms brings up a great point, and that is whether or not you find yourself devoid of a specimen due to weather or you simply don't have one. Um, yes, venerable old specimens are always memorable, but it's never too late to start a specimen. Oh, you know, yeah. this spring would be the perfect time to go ahead and say, you know what, I, my landscape doesn't really have a specimen plant. And I am going to go ahead and pick one. Now, like I said, I think picking is the hardest part. I love too many plants to commit. And I have not, you know, in shopping found one that said, this is it. This I'm your specimen. Plant me. Yet. Yeah. But maybe yeah. this year. Who knows? Well, isn't it the old Chinese proverb, best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and the next best time is today, yep, right? Yeah, absolutely. Specimen or not. Yeah. So temperate microclimates can also make a difference uh, here along the lakeshore in Michigan. I see big leaf hydrangeas, Stacy, or rhododendrons that are huge that you don't see further inland. So. Oh, that's yeah, absolutely. We have some beautiful specimen rhododendrons out here. So that's a, uh, that's a factor also, of course, on the list of specimens. Usually Japanese maples will fall in, wisteria falls in, oh, yeah. the, you know, the legendary stories of wisterias that got so big they'd take a house down on the West Coast. Uh, you know, those stories are fun. Of course, unusual evergreens uh, also. I was looking at the Gardening Simplified catalog, uh, Stacy, and I saw a sting arbor vitae. That looked really neat to me, but again, unusual evergreens. Right, and Sting Arborvitae is uh, is actually named for the sword in The <laughs> Hobbit, and uh, that's what it looks like. It's very narrow, and that does make a stunning specimen, as well as a space-saving hedge. So that's what I was saying. A lot of times, things that can be specimens are often very versatile and can double as other landscape roles. It just depends on how you use them, where you cite them in your landscape. So you would be hard-pressed to call it a specimen if it wasn't a wood plant like you think about some of these ornamental grasses that just mm. get huge you know pampas grass or or erianthus the hardy pampas grass or even some of the switchgrass you know they can be quite um quite stunning in the landscape but obviously not a woody a woody plant. Well, you know, I didn't think about ornamental grasses, and that's a great point because ornamental grasses don't disappear in the winter. Most people leave them standing. So you do have, you know, I think it's important that a specimen plant offers some level of year-round interest. And sometimes you can have an absolutely stunning perennial yeah. that's positioned like a specimen, but, you know, in winter it's kind of like what happens. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, ornamental grasses are a great choice because really the the short window where there's nothing to look at is just a matter of weeks in early spring. Just love uh, specimen plants. And, uh, do you have in, one? You have uh, I do. I have a blue atlas cedar. Oh, great choice. Is it Cedrus atlanticus? Is that how you would pronounce it? Cedrus atlanticus glauca. Yeah, yeah glauca, yeah. right. I have one of those, and again, being near the lakeshore, uh, it's more temperate, so it does uh, quite well. There were many of those lost on Long Island during uh, Hurricane Sandy. Again, mm. many trees, many specimens were lost when, uh, when Hurricane Sandy came along. In our show notes at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com, I'm going to post a story, too, of Cornelius Johnson. He was an athlete in the 1936 Olympics, and uh, he was snubbed by Adolf Hitler at the time, but he came home with a gold medal and an oak sapling, and he planted it in Los Angeles. It's now protected a huge specimen in Los Angeles. It's a great story. I, I listened to that story, and I was absolutely amazed. You know, it's one of those things that I'm sure... Being in L.A., thousands of people pass by every day without a second thought, and yet it has this amazing historical significance. 
Coming up next, we're going to put a plant on trial. Stacy's going to introduce us to, uh, I'm going to call it a, a spicy, Ooh. a spicy plant. You don't want to miss this. This is going to be fun. That's coming up next here. Plants on trial on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacy Hervella, and I'm here in the Proven Winners Color Choice Shrub Studio with Rick Weist. And we've come to the part of the show where we put a plant on trial. And what that means is that we're going to talk about one of the 320 plus Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs and tell you the story behind it. And you get to decide if it's going to earn a place in your garden or not. Now, uh, what, Rick? This is going to be fun. Oh, yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Wait. so usually I try to pick the plant on trial based on Rick's ideas for the first segment, and I didn't have any yesterday in time, and so I had to just pull something out of the air, and I realized that I have been doing a lot of talking about shrubs that are late to emerge in spring, mm -hmm. and I haven't talked to any that are early to emerge in spring. So today's plant on trial is early to emerge in spring. And it's a new variety for us, and it is Mr. Mustard Earl False Spirea. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Mr. Mustard. Yes. That's great. So uh, as you might be able to guess, Tim Wood, our new plant development manager, is a bit of a classic rock fan. If you're familiar with some of our other varieties, you know that he gets some of those, uh, those great old song references as plant names frequently. But what you might not be familiar with is this concept of this plant, Earl False Spirea. It's even hard to say. And Earl, if you're, if you're saying, is she saying rural? It's Earl with a capital <laughs> U, U-R-A-L, as in the Earl Mountains in Russia, where this plant is native. But most of the time, we just refer to it as a, a false spirea, because when you say Earl, people are like, what are you saying? Like Earl, like Duke of Earl? It's very confusing. Um, but this is a very, very tough plant that uh, emerges early in spring and really looks just breathtakingly fantastic in spring. Have you seen it oh, in spring? Gorgeous. I, I would call it a mustard piece. That's what it is. <laughs> it's so beautiful and early. And cold hardy, right? It is exceptionally cold hardy. Sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> it's hardy all the way down to USDA zone two. Okay. And heat tolerant only through USDA zone seven, which, you know, as we've discussed in the show, is not uncommon. Generally, the more cold tolerant a plant is, it's it doesn't usually have equal heat tolerance. So there's very few plants that kind of span that huge, huge range. But very, very cold tolerant, as you might guess, being from the Ural Mountains in Russia. And it's known botanically as Sorberia sorbifolia. That's a fun one to say. Yeah, that botanical name is crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. And it's based on its resemblance to Sorbus mountain ash. Aha, uh -huh, the foliage looks like it. The yes. foliage does indeed look yeah. like it. And okay. they are in the same plant family, the rosaceae or rose family. Um, but other than that, they aren't really closely related. The Earl Fulspirea does not get berries, like which is what most people think of when they think of mountain ash. But it does also have compound leaves. And compound leaves, basically, if you think of like an oak leaf, a single leaf is just one leaf all together. And a compound leaf is something like a honey locust leaf or a fern leaf where a lot of different leaflets come together on a central stalk to make a leaf, but it's made up of, of little individual leaflets. And that's one of the things that makes Mr. Mustard so special is it those individual leaflets give it so much texture in the landscape. Mm. You really kind of can't believe your eyes because they're kind of crisscrossing every way. And it just makes a lot of movement and action in the garden. But the other thing that makes it really special is its color. And that's where the Mr. Yes. Mustard part is coming in. Okay. So in spring, when the foliage starts to emerge, uh, it does so in a, uh, a almost a rainbow of colors. No blue, but you've got green, you've got chartreuse, you've got some orange in there, you've got pink, you've got red. So the newest growth is this bright red color. And then that kind of goes to pink. And then it kind of takes on some orange before it goes to yellow, then chartreuse. Wow. Any way you slice it, this will pass mustard in your landscape. No question about uh, it. That it will. Uh, it is It is a really, I mean, it's irresistible. When you see it in color in spring, It's you really can't believe your eyes. It's so beautiful. And it does flower. So it is a flowering shrub. Um, and it's flowers, even though it's called false spirea, the flowers, in my opinion, don't really look like a spirea, or like mm. most spireas that people think of. They actually look like an astilbe. 
Yeah. The perennial is still be. Yeah. If you use your imagination, it does. Yeah. yeah. They kind of have like a fluffy, spiky mm-hmm. kind of look. So I know that's all very confusing when you say spirea and, and all of these things. But you know what? That's why we don't typically use common names. And we stick with those great scientific names like Sorberia sorbifolia. Oh, I love that. I just love that. Rolls off the tongue. So really this is, so the, the blooming is going to happen in like about early summer, uh, but really it's that spring foliage that is the main event. And um, one of the things that I think this is a great plant to use for is erosion control. Okay. So uh, all aural spireas or sorberias uh, are running plants. So that doesn't mean they run like Rick does in races and that in that kind of thing. <laughs> it means that they once they're established, they put out these kind of runners from their roots and they colonize an area. Yes. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, whoa, I'm not interested. And I totally understand that. This is not going to be a shrub for any old spot in your garden. Right. If you are a person who's totally into neat, organized, maybe not... Maybe not. You know, if you're a baby boomer like me and you organize the dollar bills in your wallet from ones to fives to ten. Yes, I use cash yet. I'm a baby boomer. (laughs) Go ahead. I don't want to go down that road. Continue. Well, you know, we did have a a YouTube comment just the other day where someone said, oh, I wouldn't be interested in, it wasn't about this plant, it was about something else. I wouldn't be interested in this plant. I like my plants like well-behaved children. Uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that's not to say that this is invasive or aggressive. It just means that you need to understand that that's how it grows and use it appropriately. So this is a really excellent choice for stabilizing a bank of, you know, like a stream sure. bank or something like that. Slopes, it's an excellent choice for slopes because usually if you have a slope in your yard and you're trying to get plants to grow on it, uh, you don't want to be out there maintaining it and trying to, and weeding and trying to get things to grow. And once uh, Mr. Mustard Sorbet area is established, it's just going to be turn that slope into low maintenance and you won't have to worry about further erosion. Another great choice for this is parking lots. So like parking lot beds, you know, in oh. strip malls, churches, that kind of thing. Can it handle the heat? Uh, well, it shouldn't be a problem as long as it's within the hardiness range. Okay. So two to seven, even if it is in a parking lot, it's going to get very hot. You don't really have to worry about that. It wouldn't be able to grow in like a USDA zone eight, but as long as you're within that two to seven hardiness range, no problem. Okay. So those, so re- really looking at a plant that uh, is, is very tough, it can take any soil conditions pretty much. Um, you know, pH is not a problem. Soil moisture isn't a problem. It won't really grow well in extremely wet soil, but if, if it's occasionally wet, that's not a problem. Parking or uh, uh, road salt, mm-hmm. not a problem. I mean, this is really one tough plant, and you wouldn't know that to look at it because it is uh, really quite pretty looking. Um, but again, it's great for these problem solving areas, and I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind about all plants is that you know what, there is no one size fits all, right? Every plant has its place, and every place has a palette of plants that's perfect for it, and so you can't necessarily you know, come up with something and say, hey, this is my one solution to everything. It does take a little bit of research. And that's what we try to do at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs is give you the information that you need to find the plant that works for your conditions and know that it's the right plant for that situation. Stacy, real quickly, pollinators. Are we going to attract pollinators with Mr. Mustard Fall Spirea? You are indeed. It is. Uh, the pollinators are going to flock to those fluffy, uh, still be like blooms. Nice butterflies, bees, all that kind of thing. So it doesn't have a super long bloom time, but it will certainly be sustaining the winged visitors to your yard during that period. And speaking of visitors to your yard, uh, as I mentioned, it is in the Rose family. And very often members of the Rose family are not at all deer resistant. And I would very much group this in that category. Mm. So like I said, not every plant can be all things to all people, but it might very well work for you and whatever challenges you are dealing with in your yard. So uh, visit GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com for the show notes. You're going to see pictures of Mr. Mustard, be able to get to its uh, page on our website so you can do all your research. And you will also find Mr. Mustard, false spirea, in our Shrub Madness competition. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. By the way, before we get to Shrub Madness, operators are standing by. You have sold me in plants on (laughs) trial. You can use your Visa card if you want, but I recommend you use your Mustard card. 
Okay. Oh my golly gosh. And you know what? The MasterCard colors Sorry. are are very similar to to <laughs> Mr. Mustard. So you might be onto something there, Rick. So tell me about this. So Shrub Madness is uh our shrub competition that's coming up next month in March. And um, Mr. Mustard is one of the competitors. Now, I don't want to get too much into it because we're a little bit early. It okay. starts the March 1st. Uh, but if you go to Gardening Simplified on air, we will link you to the Shrub Madness website, which is simply shrubmadness.com. You can find out everything you need to know. But here's the thing. you got to sharpen your pencils and get ready because Shrub Madness season is upon us. Now, we have to take a little break. But when we come back, we're going to be answering your questions. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's one of our favorite times of the show because we get to answer your gardening questions, and that's one of the ways that we try to make gardening simpler for you. Now, I have a lot of questions, but we are still open to take your questions, and we will get to them. Just email us at uh, help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Click contact us, and you can send us a message. So uh, what's everybody out there wondering today, Rick? Well, Stacy, we got a picture and a question from Ellen. Is it too early in West Michigan for crocus to be at this stage? Uh, I took a look at the picture, Stacy, and it definitely is not crocus. It is early here in West Michigan. It's rather uh, winter aconite. And I love some of these minor bulbs that can be planted in fall and are some of the first bloomers in spring, whether it's winter aconite, which is pictured in the question from Ellen, or galanthus snowdrops, uh, or even some people enjoy Siberian squill mm. or scylla. However, some people consider it invasive. It gets to the point where it's invasive. Uh, but these are uh, minor bulbs that bloom early in spring and, and really uh, usher in the spring season. Well, you know, a lot of people use that term minor bulbs, but I have to confess, all of the minor bulbs are my favorite bulbs. They're major bulbs. <laughs> they are major in my book. Um, and I, I like love that. I love Aranthus or winter, winter Aconite, which, which Ellen sent. Um, I have some. They're a little bit difficult to find. Um, I think that they dry out very easily, so they tend, stores not to stock a whole lot of them. Yeah. Not, uh, but if you can get your hands on some next fall, it would be a great thing to have because they're so cheerful. They're really long blooming. They have nice foliage. And I think it's important to understand that crocus are not the only game in town when it comes to this early stuff. So many of us think, oh, crocus, that's the harbinger of spring. That means spring has started. But even among crocuses, there is a range of bloom times. Yes. There are very, very early crocuses called snow crocuses. And then there's crocuses that bloom qu quite late, like the Dutch crocuses that I think most people think of. So you can have quite a long season. You know what I have coming up uh, right now, which is also very early in my garden, is Iris reticulata. Oh, love that. Yeah. And I love the way they come Cute out. little guys. Little like swords poking yeah. out of the soil. Love it. Um, it is a little bit earlier than I would be comfortable with, which is me you know a little bit on edge mm -hmm. as i'm sure a lot of other gardeners are but you know what can you do we're at the mercy of the weather so i'm just gonna enjoy it while i can as you should with whatever bulbs are coming up yeah. in your yard and iris reticulata is a bulb iris yeah. and stacy the color is just so vivid with with that plant i love it and you know what Beautiful. else i love about it so many people complain about how messy bulb foliage is after the flowers mm -hmm. bloom mm -hmm. So neat and tidy. Yeah. It's just I, one of my absolute favorite bulbs. Awesome. All right. Angie writes to us, hi there. I have a north-facing slope that's mostly sand. We're near a lake and a forest uh, behind, so it gets very little sun. Along the top edge, it's starting to erode. Yikes. She wrote that. I <laughs> didn't throw that in there. And I struggle with what to plant there. Zone 3, sometimes 2, Alberta, Canada. Woo. That's cold. I'm looking for something that will tolerate the conditions, not require a lot of pruning, limit. Uh, she has to limit uh, climbing to sure. disrupt the soil. What would your advice be? She was thinking maybe creeping thyme or sweet woodruff. Well, those are both great ground covers, mm -hmm. and they really hint at, to me, some of the crucial characteristics that you're going to want when you're trying to stabilize soil, whether that's, again, on a stream bank or a slope or whatever. You're looking for plants with a fibrous root system, so not tap-rooted plants. And you're also looking for things that tend to run and root along their stems because the more roots that that plant puts on, the better stabilization it will do because right roots up. are key to stabilization, not mm -hmm. just simply covering the soil, but actually rooting in to the soil. That's what's really going to help 
stabilize it. Well, I think that both of these are lovely choices. Uh, for creeping thyme is a full, full sun plant. Yes. So at least six hours of sun. It's going to love your sand, but if your site's not getting at least six hours exactly. of sun every day, probably not a great choice because it will not be very happy, and then you won't be very happy, and no one wants that. Uh, and sweet woodruff, I love. It's one of my all-time favorite ground covers, but I can tell you my sandy soil is way, way too dry yeah. to grow it. And uh, so even though I love the way it looks, uh, I regretfully have none because <laughs> I also <laughs> garden in a really sandy spot. Um, so Mr. Mustard uh, Sorberia that I mentioned earlier would be a great choice. And I can guarantee you that you'll find it even in Alberta, Canada, because it is so hardy and such a good stabilizer. Um, but, you know, I think I would opt for a mix of shrubs and perennials. Um, both have potential to uh, stabilize, you know, soils like that really, really well. Um, and a mix like that can kind of help, you know, if something does start to peter out because of changing conditions. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of work together to form more of an ecosystem or colony to stabilize your hillside. Well, on the back dunes of Lake Michigan where I live, and it can get quite cold there, sandy soil definitely. I have seen three ground covers that do work well. One is Pachysandra, mm. one is Euonymus Purple Winter Creeper, and then the one I would suggest for Angie would be uh, Liriope, uh, mm. Lily Turf. Uh, they, they're evergreen in nature. You know, mine are still green out in the landscape here in winter. Uh, so Liriope fills the bill, Stacy, as far as that rooting method is concerned mm -hmm. to help hold the soil. Those would be my suggestions. Yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. I don't know if Liriope is hardy enough for uh, Alberta. I think it might be like a zone five. That's possible. But I think you bring up a good point with Liriope because if Angie were to be looking into it, she would probably see a lot of places saying, oh, you got to cut it back to get that brown foliage off. And yes, that is a nice thing to do in terms of it being, you know, a really featured part of your landscape. But if you don't do it, it's really just an aesthetic consideration. So I would keep that in mind, Angie, as you're doing your research, that even if there's pruning recommendations or it says that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do that. That's really just a recommendation to make sure it's looking its best. So we'll put all of these recommendations and a few resources for you in the show notes because this is definitely going to be a project where you're going to want to do your research and make some good decisions. Lori writes to us, I just love your show. Thank you very much, Lori. We appreciate that. I've been watching on YouTube since your first podcast. I'm in mid-Michigan zone 5B, and I'm having problems with my common lilac hedge. Common lilac. Stacy taught us last week that's vulgaris. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no offense, Lori. Sorry. <laughs> last fall, parts of it just seemed to die overnight, and I'm not sure why, and I don't see any bugs or fungal issues. Can you help me out before I lose the whole Edge. So dealing with common lilac dieback. Yeah, well, you know, uh, a few weeks ago we had Centara Double Blue. Actually, it was last week. Uh, Centara Double Blue Lilac is our featured Time plant. Time flies when you're having fun. It's true. It's true. <laughs> and I deal with so many plants that they, you know, they tend to run together in here. Um, there's one way to kill a lilac, and that is uh, bad drainage. Exactly. So I would suspect, uh, and uh, Lori, that if you're having, you know, this random dieback. Uh, and it's only about 10 years. Now, I've seen lilac hedges certainly peter out when they're very, very old and, and weren't properly maintained. But at 10 years, I don't think you're going to be having right. that issue. I would suspect that there's some sort of drainage issue that's causing parts of your plant to die. And, you know, it doesn't even have to be on your property. It can be something that's coming in from your neighbor's property because, of course, the lilac doesn't know your property lines. And it's got roots on your neighbor's you know, side mm -hmm. and on your side. Um, and that could definitely be an issue. The other thing to consider is um, that lilacs like alkaline soil. They don't want their soil oh, to be okay, very yeah. acidic. And while that's unlikely to kill the lilac mm -hmm. outright, it's definitely something worth considering because if the conditions really aren't favorable for growth, any of those stresses that do come along, like overly wet soil or, or anything like that, are going to really be magnified. And it's going to make it a lot more difficult for the plant to thrive and recover from that damage. So um, I don't know if you know what your soil pH is. You could certainly get a soil test. Um, if you aren't sure, uh, you can also use some of the, the testing kits that you can get at garden centers and that kind of thing. Um, but I would really look carefully at the drainage. And again, keep in mind that that drainage issue could be in your neighbor's yard and not even in yours. But if the soil is wet for any even brief periods of time, especially in spring and winter, 
That is bad yeah. news for lilacs. Yeah, there are fungal issues that go well beyond powdery mildew and can cause the browning of that foliage. It drops. You think the plant is dying. Uh, so I think that I think you're right on. That's what you need to do. And you know, don't throw in the trowel, okay? Because renewal pruning on lilacs will work and yeah. maybe that's what Lori needs to do. Yeah, but of course you've got to resolve, make sure it's not right. that drainage issue. And I will give you a little tip, Lori, especially as we come into spring and soil is naturally going to be more moist. If you are seeing the tips of your lilac branches doing a shepherd's crook, that is a dead giveaway that there is a drainage issue. It's so characteristic. I've seen it dozens and dozens of times with gardeners I've helped. So if you're seeing those tips, especially new tips, kind of crooking over like a cane. That's a great tip. <laughs> it's a good tip uh, for lilacs, yeah. yes. So uh, thank you all for your questions. We've got more for next week, so please do keep them coming. And right now we're going to take a little break, but when we come back, we've got branching news with Rick, and you won't want to miss that, so please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news, where we go a little outside the bounds of cultivars and pruning and that sort of thing and uh, have a little bit of fun. And Stacy, uh, I put this story in this week. And by the way, any of these stories we do, we're going to give you the links right there at gardening simplified on air.com. So you can check it out for yourself. But Stacy, I put this story in there because I know you're a bird lover. You know a lot about birds and I've been following Flacco, the freedom owl, who's uh, learning to live in the wild uh, there in Central Park in New York, Flacco is a Eurasian eagle owl who escaped the Central Park Zoo earlier this month, and people have been photographing Flacco hunting rats in the park. They were concerned, you know, maybe out on his own he wouldn't be able to deal with it, uh, but Flacco seems to be doing uh, really, really well. So Flacco live free. Uh, this owl is is out there having some fun. Yeah, and causing a lot of drama on yeah. birding Twitter. <laughs> it's turned into a free-for-all. That's what it is. <laughs> yes, it definitely has. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are like, you know, go Flacco, you know, stick it to the man. And there are a lot of people who are like... Flacco should not be a part of the New York City ecosystem yeah. and he's going to start, you know, is, is Central Park is a hugely important migratory uh, point for birds. Mm -hmm. And that as soon as all of these, you know, sweet little songbirds start coming from the south, Flacco is going to have an all you can eat bird buffet. Um, and so, you know, there's there's some truth on both sides. But boy, if you want to see some drama, you can get on Twitter oh. and search Flacco and uh, brace yourself because yikes. Um, but he is, he's a beautiful owl and Gorgeous. he's, he's been very easy to spot. He's been very gregarious, you know, hanging out in where people are. Um, and yeah, basically doing, seems like his owl instincts, despite his, uh, captivity at the Central Park Zoo are fully intact. Yeah. He escaped the zoo because he wanted to be owl by himself, but owls well, that ends well. So fun story. We'll follow that. Okay, this is interesting, Stacy. Uh, sandy soils that traditionally haven't been ideal for growing crops may become bountiful farmland with new water retaining technology developed by a Michigan State University researcher. So the farm field system involves using thin plastic sheeting buried at specific depths to better hold moisture in reach of crop roots, and they've seen significant increase in plant root water uptake. I wonder if this is something that has uh, has legs for other plant material too. So it looks like they're putting a thin sheet of plastic in the soil at a certain depth, and it's helping retain the water on these these sandy soils. That I don't know. You know, we talk often about drainage, right? <laughs> Yikes! But yeah, it's hard to say it. You know, I I didn't see any pictures of it or read a lot more about it, but. Um, that seems to be what it's saying is that it's, it's you know, preventing that evaporation from deeper down in the soil. Uh, you know, maybe there's some sort of perforation that allows some, because, you know, when, when a plant gets overwatered, it's basically deprived of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So if there is some sort of, you know, perforation or something that's allowing some moisture to evaporate, so 
all of the soil pores aren't just filled with water. I don't know. I'm not an agricultural researcher, but I'm pretty sure this guy knows what he's talking about or this woman. So uh, I'm going to read more about that. But it is very interesting. Um, but of course, here in West Michigan, despite our sandy soils, we do have a lot of corn and soybean and blueberry farming. So Absolutely. Uh, now it's going to be fun to watch. Fun to watch. Here's another story. Uh, I don't know if you, did you watch the Super Bowl? I did. Yeah. Okay. So the new turf surface at this year's Super Bowl is Tahoma 31. That's what they call it. It's a newer breed of grass. There's been a lot of controversy because uh, a lot of the uh, the football players were slipping on the mm -hmm. grass. It was uh, developed with the funding of the United States Golf Association, but it's a mix of two types of Bermuda grasses and rye grass developed at Oklahoma State University. So a cross of China Bermuda grass and African Bermuda grass. Wow, fascinating. They've been working on this for years, and now they have this turf that they just kind of roll in and, and they play football on it. You know, it's, we talk a lot about new plant development on the ornamental side with proven winners for annuals, perennials, and shrubs, but turf is on its own planet mm -hmm. when it comes to plant breeding. And, you know, you, you look at grass and to the untrained eye, it all looks the same. And it's like, yep, that's grass is grass. <laughs> but there is <laughs> so much research that goes into turf grass breeding for sports and golf yep. and, and lawns and all of these different things. And it's really fascinating. I remember hearing a story once about a turf grass scientist who was on a plane and the plane was coming in for a landing and he was coming over, you know, the, the runway always has all these, you know, grassy strips. And he noticed something and somehow managed to get permission to go out. This was obviously well before our security nowadays. <laughs> managed to get permission to go out there and collect it and somehow developed some important turf. Really? Right, because he had that bird's eye view. Yeah, turf people are a, a, a different breed, as yeah, it were. <laughs> they are. I have always found they're always in search of, uh, it's what I call instant grassification. That's what they're looking for. And so they're always developing these new uh, blends of turf. And I don't know, I guess when the going gets turf, the turf get going. So we'll follow that story also. Okay, go ahead and bring your salad or your fruit to bed with you. That's right. A study of 2,000 Americans found 47% have eaten snacks or meals in their own bed. 34%, uh-uh, no way, this ain't going to happen. Now, uh, almost... Uh, half of those prefer sitting on top of the covers, the other half under the covers while they're eating, and why that's important, I have no idea. But eating fruit, veggies, chocolate, apple pie is perfectly acceptable behavior to the majority of people. The no-no list is soup, pasta, roast dinner, stir-fry, curry, fish and chips, tacos, ramen noodles, hot dogs, and meat and mashed potatoes. Uh, I, I, I know we don't want dead air, but I have to confess I'm a little speechless at the mere concept of someone eating tacos in bed. I know. I know. It's like everything goes. Nothing mattress anymore. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I, can't, I honestly, I have difficulty believing that the percentage that doesn't eat in bed is as low as 34%. I know. It's I, not a topic I've often discussed with people I know, but I'm willing to bet that most of them would, would have a similar look on their face as I do. At you this know, moment. You're, you're right. This is something that doesn't come up in conversation often, and, and that's why we have it on the show today. It's, <laughs> it's branching news. So I'm just going to leave it at that, and, uh, and you make up your, your own mind. But to I the suspect majority, those answers were anonymous. I <laughs> would guess so. <laughs> But don't feel guilty if you're eating fruit in bed. All right. Uh, City of Boston, I just threw this in there. We'll put the link at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Uh, but the City of Boston has announced a comprehensive plan to allow permanent outdoor dining across the city. And the reason I bring that up, Stacy, is because uh, uh, during COVID and post-COVID, it's really changed the way we dine. And a lot of dining is moving outdoors. And 
And the horticultural industry is tied into that because we want to have pretty flowers and plants around us while we're dining. It, it's been quite something to watch. It has. And, you know, not every plant is suitable. It depends on what people are going for. Sometimes they want to create more privacy. Sometimes they just want to create a really eye-popping display. Um, but I think there's, there is huge opportunity for the planters and the plants and the design and all of these different things. And, you know, obviously there was a lot of horrible things that came out of COVID, but outdoor dining is one that I definitely hope hope is here to yeah. stay because you know I'll tell you if I have my choice I'll always pick to eat outside if the weather allows oh me too and rest uh, you know restaurants are learning how to deal with plants in addition to everything else that they have to deal with because you don't want window boxes or planters out there of dead plants as your patrons yeah. are enjoying a nice meal and so they've had to learn how and, and which plant varieties do best in these uh, city conditions so I just think that it's been uh, fascinating fascinating to watch. Well, you know, in my past life, I was the horticulturist at Tavern on the Green yes. restaurant in New York City uh, for three years. And I learned a lot about which plants can take spilled drinks uh-huh. and, <laughs> and which plants can, you know, be stepped on and, uh, you know, cigarettes and all of these horrible things. Um, and, you know, overall, I would say that I have been surprised that plants are as resilient as they are. But mm-hmm. I think ultimately the success of this is going to come down to staff training because they're tempted to just be like, okay, well, I always dump the leftover drinks into this particular spot on the planter. (laughs) So if they're going to be dumping those drinks out, they're going to have to be trained to spread the love there over all of them. But uh, you know what? More plants in the world is not a bad thing at all. Yeah, you got it. We'll, uh, we'll have the links there at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. We want to thank Adriana Robinson for all her work, the great work she does, engineering and producing this show. Stacy, always a privilege and pleasure to do, do the show with you, and, and uh, happy trellis to you until we meet again. Indeed. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>